pretty weird. It's very high octaving. You have uh, the left and right and the left and the right and the left and the right and the middle and the left and the middle and the right. And it's just really weird to like pick that up and play with that and play with it and uh, just to sort of uh, make it sound like it's still there. It's just really interesting to play with. Um, a lot of people have mentioned it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real great pleasure to be here. To I have lots of friends in uh, Sheffield from the School of Psychology, so it's really nice that uh, Neil and Magnus have uh, come to uh, to the Institute to speak. So the work I'm going to talk about is joint with a number of people. So Nathaniel Dorr is now a, a, um, a uh, now a, has a faculty position at NYU. Ray Dolan is one of my colleagues in London. Uh, Jan Glasher is a Bernstein Prize winner who's in uh, Hamburg. Quentin Hughes is a student who's in now in London. Yael Mead is in Princeton. John Adoki is a uh, collaborator who's now a professor in um, uh, uh, Caltech, and Klaus Gundelich is a postdoc in London. So um, it's very appropriate. This fellow is uh, Jeremy Bentham. I don't know if you've uh, uh, any of you have seen this picture of him before, but he is a he was the spiritual uh, godfather of UCL, and indeed his mummified body lives outside the provost's office in UCL. And I like this picture particularly, um, although it's not the best picture of him, which you can actually see, because this is actually his. He has two heads. He has a wax head, and this is actually his real original mummified head. He used to, uh, and indeed his mummified head uh, used to take part in college meetings. So if you're in your new institute, you ever need somebody who always says yes, or at least never says no, I recommend strongly bringing a mummified head of a former founder to uh, your meetings. So the reason I put him there is that uh, Bentham is uh, not only the spiritual godfather of UCL, but also he is um, uh, famous for his work on utilitarianism. So the ideas about uh, trying to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. He has a lovely uh, description in some of his work writings of 12 different sorts of pain and 14 different sorts of pleasure. And so reinforcement learning is really all about you know, uh, maximizing uh, uh, pleasure and minimizing pain. So that's really what I'm going to be trying to talk to you about today, which is how we satisfy um, Bentham's maxims. So uh, the uh, what I'm going to do is spend about half the time talking about reinforcement learning, so a modern neural theory of reinforcement learning. I expect many of you will have heard some of this from uh, Kevin and from uh, uh, in investigators here in Sheffield, so I'll just give you our view about this. One of the key things that come up, that comes up, is that there are really multiple mechanisms inside the brain, many of which we can identify based on lovely psychologi psychological work by a, a, a range of investigators, and also we've been doing some imaging tasks ourselves to try and look at them. And so these are different mechanisms which are completely incorporated to do control. And so then what I'm going to do is spend the, spend the other half of the time talking about some recent experiments that we've been done, trying to explore the ways that these systems cooperate and compete. And the idea is really that it's a good idea to have more than one system. They occupy different sweet spots in different sorts of uh, computationally relevant parameters. And so what we're going to try and understand is, you know, how can we see the way that they're interacting? So some of it is uh, fairly preliminary work, as you will see. And uh, so I hope you're know, interested in the discussion and ideas that you might have around it. OK, so I'm going to talk about, first of all, start up talking about these three controllers and then talk about uh, ways that these different controllers interact in, in, in a couple of different experiments. So um, this is a picture of Kasparov playing Deep Blue, which is this uh, very famous uh, a match between uh, uh, Deep Blue and um, the, 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 the world chess champion at the time. And um, famously, in the end, Deep Blue, after in the second match, uh, Deep Blue actually beat Kasparov. And so then uh, IBM then retired Deep Blue and got to solve Jeopardy instead. Um, which uh, they're probably scared of a rematch. But uh, the question for us is, what, how is it, we know quite a bit about how Deep Blue solves chess, and we're going to argue that maybe Kasparov solves chess in some similar way. So on the right, what you see is a upside down chess, I think I can find the right way up chess. And so, as you'll be familiar with, you have a chess position like the one at the top, and there's a tree of possibilities. So from there, you go, the, in this case, there may be four moves that um, uh, uh, you could make, you know, move your pawn, move your king, or so forth. Then there'd be a set of moves that Kasparov can make, and then a set of moves that you can make, and so forth. And that then leads from one board position to another board position. So um, the trouble in chess is that the branching factor, that's to say the number of moves at any one time, is of the order of 30. Of course, it depends where you are in the game. Um, and the depth of the tree, if you're playing Kasparov, maybe, maybe you get beaten in three moves, but you know, if you're playing a, your, your chums down the road, maybe it's of the order of 70. So the size of this tree is absolutely monumentally vast. So you can't search the whole tree to work out what to do, so what can you do instead? Okay, so there are different mechanisms embodied in something like Deep Blue. Um, as I said, we're going to argue that we see those in rats and in humans and in um, possibly even in invertebrates. So the, the one mechanism is indeed tree search. So if you see in your newspaper things like you know, two moves to mate, for instance, they're inviting you to build a little tree and say that there are two moves. You move one piece, and then the, your opponent will move something and can't escape, and then you move one more piece, and then you, and then you uh, beat them. So tree search is a perfectly viable method of doing um, control if you only have something like two moves. 
to check in general positions, that's not going to be useful. So the second mechanism we have is a position evaluator, or deep blue thing. And that's just a function which says, here for this chess position, is that a good position or a bad position? Where we define good as meaning, are you likely to win if you start at that position? Now, if your position evaluator were perfect, then you wouldn't need to build the tree at all, or search the tree at all. Because you just say, I can think of all the 30 moves I can do. Let me imagine each of those moves in turn, then ask how likely am I to win by my position evaluator for each of those places I get to, and I'm just going to move to the position to which I think I'm most likely to win from. So if you had a perfect position evaluator, you only need to look at those sets of states, those positions, and you don't need to build the rest of this vast tree because that position evaluator would tell you the right thing to do. And one of the um, sort of most interesting results in reinforcement learning, which really is essentially one of the earliest results in AI, is that it's possible to learn those sorts of position evaluators from experience without building these trees. And so we'll talk about how that works. So then the third thing that Kasparov and Deep Blue have is a situation memory, like an opening book, for instance. They have an extensive list of things that they should start to do right at the beginning. Okay, so that's what it looks like in chess. What does it look like in uh, animals? So the tree search, or the model-based system, um, is uh, very closely related to something which uh, was explored in the uh, early part of the last century by a psychologist called Coleman. So you had this notion of a cognitive map, which is a very influential notion, very strongly attacked at the time because of work by, the, by behaviorists. And he had in mind that animals would indeed build a model of the task they had to solve and then search in this model to work out what the right thing to do was. So, and then so you could do forwards. There are a number of ways you can search the tree. They didn't know at the time how that works, and we still don't know completely how that works. We have some idea. So here's how it looks in a, in a very simple animal experiment, just to get you oriented. So in this experiment, um, so this is an experiment done by um, Bernard Belain, Tony Dickinson, the data actually from Peter Holland, the cartoons are from Bernard Belain. The idea here is imagine you train an animal to press a lever to get some cheese. And you can train him for either a short time or an extensive time. Um, what they then did is to devalue the cheese. So they give the animal cheese with no levers around and pair it with, say, lithium chloride. That makes the animal sick. You could also just feed him so much cheese he doesn't want to eat the cheese anymore. But you see the animal in its hospital bed trying to recover. Um, then you come back later and you test. You just give the animal the lever and ask, is he willing to press the lever or not? And what you see is the following, which is if you've trained at the beginning for a short time, so only moderate amount of training, what this shows is how willing is he to press the lever if the, lever, if the cheese has been devalued or not. So if it's been devalued, he's less willing to press the lever than if it's not devalued. And the idea is the animal's putting together a very simple syllogism, which is I press the lever to get the cheese. I'm not interested in the cheese, so I'm not going to press the lever. So that's a very simple piece of cognitive ma mapping and tree search, which then they essentially fail. The interesting thing is if you train for longer after extensive training at the beginning, now even though the animal wouldn't eat the cheese if you offered it to him, He's still perfectly willing to press the lever um, to get the cheese. We'll talk about that in a minute. But for a start, let's think about this tree system, the one that could do syllogi simple syllogisms. Um, so we know quite a lot about uh, regions of the brain involved in this because of this tests like this. So areas in the prefrontal cortex, like the orbital frontal cortex, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, areas of the striatum, like the dorsal medial striatum, and parts of the amygdala, like the basal lateral medial amygdala. So there's a big network of structures which are all seem to be involved in building the evaluation and uh, doing this searching process that we see for this Kolmanian forward model. From a computational point of view, this way of doing control has two key characteristics. It's statistically efficient and computationally catastrophic. So by statistical efficiency, what I mean is every little piece of knowledge you can learn in just the right time. So you learn pressing the lever, you get the cheese. Um, eating the cheese makes you sick. And so the learning is very simple in this because you don't have any you know, complexity. There's no temporal complexity associated with it, for instance. You just get instant information of feedback about what, what happens. But the consequence of that is to use that knowledge is computationally very difficult because you have to put together these syllogisms. Like in the tree, it's very easy to learn the effect of moving a pawn. Um, but if you wanted to search the, uh, the consequence uh, uh, downstream in terms of winning or losing the game of moving your pawn, that's much more complicated. And so the computational use of this tree-based information is really tough because you have to search these big structures inside the tree to work out what to do. OK, so what's the other system? Um, so the other system is this one which I talked about in terms of position evaluation, right? So the here the idea is, can you learn how good a point in the tree is without ever building this tree in the first place? It seems like it seems strange in the first place, but we'll see exactly how this works. So the idea here is we have a system that works by essentially minimizing inconsistency between successive predictions of what's going to happen. So in the case of chess, it might be that you start at a position 
and you, you, know, you, you then do the best move from that position, which therefore is defined by how good your position evaluation is supposed to be. And then uh, Kasparov does a move, and you get to a new position, and suddenly, where you thought this was a really good place where you're very likely to win, Kasparov can do a move which leads you to a place where you're very unlikely to win. So suddenly your position evaluator gave two successive evaluations which are inconsistent with each other. It shouldn't be that from a position which your evaluator says is good, meaning you're likely to win, that Kasparov can do a single move and get to a position which suddenly your own evaluator says is now bad. You're now really likely to lose. So the fact that there's an error between those two is an inconsistency that you can use for training. So um, uh, more formally, imagine what you're trying to do. You're, you're say, a little rat running around a maze where there's like little bits of cheese in parts of the maze. Then imagine what you're trying to do is predict something about the future. That's what's interesting about the about the um, the chess case. You make a move now, but you lose you know, many many uh, after many um, follow subsequent moves. So um, imagine you're trying to predict something like the sum of future rewards you're going to get. So the sum of the number of you know, little bits of cheese you're going to get over the course of your of your of your move through this maze. So um, you can split up this sum into the first term, just the immediate reward r of t. And then all the subsequent terms, so r of t plus 1, r of t plus 2, and so forth. And if your predictions are correct, then we can expect the left-hand side to equal the right-hand side. So if your predictions are correct, the value of the state you get to, x of t plus 1, is just the sum of all those rewards you get, but not starting at t, but starting at t plus 1. So put another way, imagine that in my backpack I have brought um, Smarties for you all, maybe three Smarties for each of you. Oh, that's big enough. Um, then you might suddenly now predict this unexpected uh, predi uh, positive prediction error for this, you know, these three smarties you're going to get. So now, if I give you one smarty, that's like, so your v of x of t should be three suddenly, because I've told you this, this three. If I give you one smarty, r of t is one, then you predict two more smarties in your future, if you're sensible, right? And so three in that case is just one plus two. So in general, um, uh, if your successive predictions are not consistent, you didn't know before you came into this room that you were going to get uh, three smarties, but now you know that, then we can use the difference between the left and right-hand side of this equation, what should be an equation, as a prediction error for doing training. So this is, this del this is called the temporal difference prediction error signal. So it's a signal that was suggested by Rich Sutton and Andy Barto, but really dates back to the work of Arthur Samuel in the, in the 1950s, when he was, uh, really, as I said, really right at the beginning of AI. So... The idea is we can learn an evaluator for chess or checkers, as uh, Samuel was working on, or indeed um, for future cheese in a maze, based on these um, prediction error signals. And it's model free in the sense that I didn't have to build a model of the world. Right? There's no tree here. There's all I do is I just experience things. So I'm just running through my maze, going from one state to the next, and building a model, or build a, sorry, building a value function, a function which says how much cheese do I have in my future based on where I am. And so I don't need to have a, a tree structure. I don't need to worry about that at all. Another way of thinking about it is it's cash in the sense of saving something. So what you're doing is you're saving the results of your past experience through this maze um, in terms of these value functions, these Vs. And we know quite a bit about the uh, neural representation of this. And I'm sure you've heard about this from Pete Redgrave and Kevin and um, over, the, over the years. So there's some evidence from uh, Wolfram Schultz. So it's a little bit controversial, as you may have heard from them. But there's some uh, strong evidence from Wolfram Schultz and now me uh, various other investigators that the activity of the phasic activity of dopamine neurons um, uh, reports something which looks like these prediction errors. So dopamine is a neuromodulator. So it's not a fast neurotransmitter. It's something which is involved in regulating pl uh, plasticity and excitability of neurons. And we think particularly for this case, um, the uh, plasticity is important. And we know that dopamine is in involved in reward processing because it's a neuromodulator which is involved, for instance, with all drugs of addiction. So they hijack the normal mechanisms that you use to evaluate outcomes. And so, um, uh, as you can imagine, that can exert a very strong influence on your behavior. If you, somebody sort of steals the reward button inside your, inside your head, they can, you know, that, can, that mechanism can then uh, lead to all sorts of problems. Um, and so this is an example, for instance, of, a, of the act phasic activity of dopamine neurons in a task in which the animal would see a stimulus, like a light, which he knew to predict the future delivery of a re reward, let's say a few drops of juice in his mouth, after a, after a second and a half. And what's happened here is Schultz has done an experiment in which the light comes on, but in fact he's, given, he's denied the animal the juice that he expects. So if you just look at the time when the, um, the juice should come, what you see is a dip below baseline in the activity of these neurons. And that's a sign that the animal has learned a prediction that there should be um, reward there. 
And this prediction error is therefore negative at that time because the animal expected his drops of juice, therefore he expected the internal report of these drops of juice. It hasn't, been ar it hasn't arrived until you get a dip below baseline. If Schultz had given the monkey the juice, what you'd see is that the activity of the neurons would look just like baseline because there's no prediction error at that point. He expects juice. If he gets juice, there's no prediction error. If he expects juice and doesn't get it, you see a negative going prediction error, which is really just what comes out of this signal. What this signal also predicts is before the animal got the CS, the light, he didn't know he was going to get the juice. Just like before you walked into this room, you didn't know you were going to get your three um, Smarties. And so the signature of the system reporting the, the prediction error associated with the Smarties or the drops of juice is actually this activity now at the time of the CS, in the time of my report to you that you're going to get your three Smarties. And so that also is something which is predicted by exactly this rule. So that's why we think this rule is, is a good way of characterizing what's happening with these neurons. And we know quite a bit about the structures involved in this, which are other areas of the striatum, like the dorsolateral striatum. So the key thing about this system is it's motivationally insensitive. So if you remember in this task where we poisoned the cheese um, and asked whether the animals are willing to press, what you see is that they're here. Um, they are just as willing to press the lever as if they, the cheese had not been poisoned, even though they wouldn't eat the cheese. And the idea here is all they've learned is a number. They said pressing the lever is worth three utils to me, or whatever it is in terms of the, the, the value. They don't know that that number is attached to cheese. And in fact, why the reason why this system is going to be good for you is because it doesn't have to know, uh, it doesn't have to know about the, that it's a cheese consequence which leads to this state being good. They just know it's a good state to be in. And so pressing the lever, in this case, may be worth you know, their three utils. Which means that when we poison the cheese, they don't know that the cheese is no longer, the, they don't know that the fact that the cheese is no longer worthwhile translates into the, uti the utility of pressing the lever has decreased. They don't know that. Therefore, they can quite happily carry on pressing the lever. So you might think this is just something that rats do, but in fact, uh, John O'Dockerty did a lovely experiment with um, Caltech undergraduates where he trained them for three days to press a button to get M&Ms, so the American version of Smarties. Then he came back and he fed them as many M&Ms as they could eat, so they were no longer in eat interested in eating M&Ms. So for Caltech undergraduates, that's a lot of M&Ms. And then he came them back and he offered them the lever, and they would still press the lever, even though they wouldn't eat the M&Ms that, that, that he would then give them for pressing the lever. Um, so that shows you that the, the, so the Caltech undergraduates were habitizing just like the uh, rats were doing. So Caltech undergraduates and rats are the same. You heard it here. So in terms of our computational characteristics we talked about, there are two, um, it has exactly the opposite characteristics for the, from the model basis control. So it's statistically inefficient, but computationally convenient. So it's statistically inefficient because it's learning by bootstrapping. So that's the sense where, remember I said that you're essentially learning by making predictions about how good the state is, and then you have prediction errors associated with your future predictions, right? Because you're minimizing inconsistency. But when you start learning, neither the starting prediction you make nor the prediction from the next step you get to is based on data, right? You just started learning, which means that the f training signal you have in that V of th this delta of T is not based on good quality information because it's just you're just trying to make consistent things which are not yet consistent with the world. Therefore, it's statistically inefficient to use. Oh, sorry, it's statistically inefficient in learning. However, in terms of computation, it's really easy to use. You don't have to build this whole tree and search the tree. You just have direct access to whether it's a good idea or not because you know about these number of ut this utility. So it has the nice opposite characteristics of model-based control. And because it has those opposite characteristics, that's why it's a good idea to have both systems in, you know, uh, uh, um, in general. Okay, here's a third controller, which is um, I, we think of as a, as a Pavlovian controller, which I'm going to introduce with the following um, example. This is an experiment done by Hirschberger who, um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the 80s. So this uh, looks like a beheaded civil servant, but it's actually a, a chicken feeder, and that's a chicken. So Hirschberger did a lovely experiment in which he did the following. He trained the chicken that if he ran towards a chicken feeder, the chicken feeder would run away at twice the speed. I think you can probably predict what happens next. And he also trained it that if he ran away from the feeder, the feeder would run towards him at twice the speed. So the way that the chicken, feeder get, the chicken gets fed is by running away from his source of food. And so needless to say, the chickens couldn't learn this, this what to do. And if you think about it, you know, it's just a bizarre thing, right? You know, they, they don't come born knowing what chicken feeders are, or the head of civil servants give them their, give them their corn. Um, and all they have to do is to learn a simple instrumental action, which is you know, one direction of, of, of movement with respect to this bizarre object in order to get fed. 
And they, the fact they can't learn that is telling us that there's a little piece of evolutionary programming in the chicken, which says it's a good idea to approach and engage with your sources of food, because you know, in general they don't run away, they don't run towards you when you run away from them. That's just not how it's ever worked for the last 200 million years. So there's no reason why it should start now. Um, now, for the case of reward, that's you know, mildly amusing. For the case of punishment, it's much more significantly important. And indeed, you have structure. This is a structure um, called the Periac structural gray, which has a topographic mapping of a set of species-typical, species-specific defensive responses, which allow you to essentially um, avoid predators in, um, in, in and uh, avoid threats in circumstances. And the important thing about, about uh, fear and about defensive me mechanisms is you can't afford to learn for yourself what to do, right? Because so you've had you know, failed ancestors to sacrifice themselves um, in order that you should have essentially a better periodical grade. And when I say it has this topographic mapping, it's even at the level of, so blood flow control. So for instance, if Neil threatens me, I have to decide whether to run away or to fight him, because obviously running away would be better since he's bigger. Um, so, but if I want to run away, I'd like to have blood flow in my legs so I can run first. Whereas I want, to, uh, uh, I want to fight him, I want to have blood flow in my arms so I can punch him. And so indeed, at the level of the periagraphical gray, it looks like you have that degree of uh, even vascular control. So we're going to see uh, later some ways that Pavlovian control interferes with instrumental control. So like in the chicken case, um, there, instrumental control says, do what it takes in order to get fed. Right? So you just learn some arbitrary action. So from a reinforcement learning point of view, it should be straightforward. But the Pavlovian mechanism says, here's a piece of automatic programming, move towards your, your sources of food. And so as experimenters, we can make that not work or make that have it be difficult. And we'll see other examples of that in a minute. OK, so now we have these multiple mechanisms. So how are we going to choose between them? So one idea, at least about the instrumental system, so the model based on model free control, is that choice depends on uncertainty. Now here, remember I argued that the model based system is statistically efficient. So it's, it's less uncertain in terms of learning. However, because of the computational cost, so building these trees in your head, you can't do it accurately, which means that therefore there'll be uncertainty associated with the evaluation of states, which means that that system is going to be uncertain um, to in use. Whereas the model free system is statistically inefficient for learning, so it takes a, a while for uncertainties over learning to decrease, but it's computationally easy to use, and therefore it should be better later on. So what we think is the habitization process we saw of going from moderate training to extensive training, going from some actions where you don't press the lever to being willing to press the lever even though you wouldn't eat the cheese, is really a mark of this habitization process of going from something which is controlled by the model-based system to the model-free system. So the benefits of having multiple things, uh, multiple systems are, well, of course, redundancy. It means that if one of them goes wrong, you still have the capacity for control from others. They occupy these different sweet spots in experience versus computation. So they, they, you know, that's the reason why you would want to have them as a robot. And then in terms of Pavlovian control, they also allow evolutionary input to decision making. So priors, basically, for, uh, for the Bayesians amongst you, obviously are a really important aspect of what to do, particularly in the context of huge action spaces. You know, we live in a space where the number of actions we can possibly do is, is phenomenally large. And so we need to have guidance, essentially, from evolution as to what's a good idea, what it's a good idea to do. So the Pavlovian control gives us evolutionary input decision-making. And when you do an experiment like Hirschberger, you're essentially competing you know, a few hundred million years' worth of evolution against 15 minutes in a lab. And so it's not really surprising that the evolution wins. The cost of having multiple systems is competition. So now these systems are competing with each other. And so that obviously is going to be a problem. They could go wrong. They, they could have you could the, the wrong one could win under some circumstances. And it certainly, from our perspective, it really complicates reverse engineering because you know, neuroscientists love or psychologists like to do things like lesion studies, which will then you know, try to knock out some aspect of control. But if you have all these other controllers hanging around, which can then do control as well, it means that it's really hard to interpret. You say the behavior survives, for instance, a dopaminergic lesion. Well, that'd be fine. Maybe it's gone from being model free, so the system which involves dopamine, the model, um, the habit system, to being model based. And you'd have to do a specific test to check that. You have to know what the structure of control actually is on any particular circumstance. OK, so that completes um, my very brief tour of sort of modern theories of neural reinforcement learning. What I want to do now is give you just some experiments that, are that we're, we're doing um, to try and explore different ways these systems interact, which I think sort of shows that, that in fact, there's a richer picture of interaction than, 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 in fact, certainly than we expected at the beginning. And I think we're just trying to, we're now just uh, ourselves and other people are trying to understand some of these nature of these interactions. So I'm going to start with a one which has to do with the Pavlovian interactions with um, actually model-based control in this case. So 
um, one of the things, one of the basic defensive mechanisms in tabla in the uh, you know like the periodic cycles of Gray, for instance, is that in the face of prediction of punishment, is to do is behavior inhibition or sort of pruning. It says that you know if you had a think that there's a danger, uh, some danger associated with a course of action, it's a really good idea just to stop doing whatever you're doing, and then you know, because perhaps it's leading you into trouble, and that allow that would in principle allow reassessment. It might allow other sorts of um, uh, uh, other sorts of defensive mechanisms to take over. So we were interested in uh, trying to understand this as a Pavlovian thing. It's not based on a prediction about a conflict. This says, you know, if you have a value which is negative, then maybe you have an automatic inhibitory mechanism, which we're going to uh, catch in a minute as an automatic pruning mechanism, which will come and change the way that you explore states of the world, and maybe you explore states in your internal model of the world. So the idea is that there's maybe there's going to be some sort of predominant action. We'll see in terms of tree search in a minute what that might be. And then as a function of the a level of mechanisms involved in behavioral inhibition, that you actually just inhibit paths which are associated with negative predictions. So here, we think the thing which is in control of this is a neuromodulator called serotonin, uh, for which there's, there's some evidence about its role in this behavioral inhibition process. And the idea is that if you get to states where those states have negative values, then you tend to prune away those states or prune away actions leading to those states. Whereas if those states have positive values, then you just carry on, you don't prune, you don't prune away. So it's a very primitive mechanism, right? It's not really based on anything. Maybe you have to go through, maybe uh, you have to go through a punishment in order to get a reward. This mechanism won't really know about that, and therefore it will happily prune away, even in cases where it won't be a good idea. We're going to argue this is a crutch for decision making. It's a heuristic that in some circumstances may be good. That may be why it evolved in this way. And then we can speculate what might happen if you've been relying on this as a crutch for your decision making, and then something, uh, biological for instance, kicks that crutch away. If you have some problem with your serotonergic processing, what consequence will that be for the sorts of behavior that you will get? Um, okay, so here's how we uh, operationalize this uh, task. So we did a task which is a, so it's a little bit small here. It's uh, going to be a task, um, let me see if I think I have it on the next uh, slide. So um, what we have is a series of, we train our subjects in the following task. There's a series of six boxes here, and at each box there are two actions, which we label as U and I, so they're going to press one of two keys on this, uh, on, this, uh, on, this, on this screen. And from each place, there's actually a transition matrix that we train subjects. We don't show them, but we train them. So for instance, from six, you have action one, you know, the U, let's say, gets you to one, I, let's say, gets you to three, from three, you know, one action gets you to U, gets you to four, I gets you to six, and so forth. So, you, so basically, there's a predominant series of actions which can take you around the chain, and there are then a set of interior actions which take you from one state, um, from I I one state to another. So we train subjects extensively on the dynamics of the world, so they know they should have learned about what, how they get from one place to another. And then what we do is we tell them that there are values associated with particular of these actions. So, and in fact, the values are shown on top of these actions. So here, this one is worth plus 140 points. This one is worth plus 20 points, minus 20 points. And then we have one, which we're going to call minus x, which uh, for three different groups of subjects, one is x is 140, another gr group x is 100, another group x is 70. So there are groups which is very expensive and groups which is not so expensive. And so what we ask subjects to do is to say, after they've learned this task, we say, tell me, we say, well, you're starting in this state here, tell me the next four moves that you would like to make. So they have to, ahead of time, use their knowledge, they have to build this tree, right, to try and decide what to do in order to maximize the number of points. So for instance, you know, they want to get into states where they, they don't have to take these big negative uh, Xs, and instead they want to, but on the other hand, they do want to try and get this large positive reward. So just as for the case of chess, we can represent the task by the tree, which you see in the top left. Um, and here you see the U key is the green guy, the, uh, the, um, the, the uh, orange, the yellow one is the uh, I key. And so here I asked them to do, th they, allowed, they had three moves they're allowed to do. So the first one to minus one, uh, they could do to minus 140. As they go U, so presumably it's uh, maybe they're somewhere like state two. Um, and then they have a sequence of other things they can do. They can get minus 20 and plus 20. And then, or they could take the minus 20 and, and go, so they go either path at the beginning. So here, if you have three choices, it's binary, so there are eight outcomes, no, eight possible outcomes at the end. So what we expected, uh, so in this case, there are actually two optimal paths, which are shown by those two blue minus 20s in the bottom. So in both cases, you're losing here, but, the, uh, but you can lose a lot or lose a little. Um, and in fact, either way, you can get them either going through the, plus the minus 140 early or the or, uh, or you can just get this minus 20 and then, and then recover by being able to get this big positive thing, so this big plus 140 up there. Or you can take the 20 here. And what we expected is that um, there would be this primitive pruning mechanism due to serotonin, we believe, that would essentially get rid of paths 
where you had to go through the large negative punishment. So it's just that he says, you know, this is a bad state. We're just not even going to think about building a tree with that. It's just a heuristic for pruning your tree. You need some heuristic because these trees can get very large. So what we did is we uh, trained subjects on this, and then we basically then uh, looked at the, their behavior. Now, the important thing to realize is it's really expensive to... Um, so in the case of where in this group where X is 140, it turns out that there's no benefit. This shows the ben the, the how much you lose by doing this pruning. So in this case, it turns out you never lose by pruning because essentially the largest negative reward is the same as the largest, largest positive reward, and therefore this is just zero. But in these other groups where we reduce the size of this large negative um, punishment from to 100 or 70, it becomes really expensive to, or it can be expensive to do this pruning because you're basically denying yourself the possibility of getting this large positive reward because you might have to take this large negative um, punishment along the way. So what this shows you is the cost from different states depending on how many choices you have to go if you just do this automatic pruning mechanism. And what we're going to find is that our subjects were extremely willing to prune um, uh, despite this. Okay, so here are the results. So what we're going to do is to show you a model of um, how... W so what we're going to do is build a reinforcement learning model which has these various components. So there's Pavlovian components, there's model-based and sort of model uh, uh, model-based components. And ask how well we can predict this, the choices that subjects will make. So, and these are the four groups. And here, these are the cases we look at the first choice. So this is a set of choices where we ask them to make eight choices, eight, eight choices in, in, in a row. So here they make eight choices before it ever moves. So they have to really think their way through what this gonna, what's going to happen. Um, uh, but we're looking at the first choice. Okay, so the full first thing you might do is to have this full tree-based model that builds a complete tree, just like the, the thing for chess, right? You know, it could be hard in the case of eight, but easy in the case of one. So that has a prediction of a, of a value, says how good is it to do an action at a state, which is essentially any immediate reward plus, you know, basically you just solve it just like dynamic programming. In fact, it's just the same predi future prediction stuff that I just talked about before. So the black line, the, this, uh, um, uh, this uh, thin black line, shows you how well a model based just on that predicts the choices that subjects make. So if they only have a few choices to go, one or two, it does actually a pretty good job of predicting what they do. So the probability is up to almost uh, like 90% in terms of choosing what they'll do. That's because it's really easy, right? And so people can build that tree fairly well. But as the number of choices to go gets big, the model gets terrible, right? So you can see that it goes down to chance. You know, there are only two actions. So here, 50-50 is chance. So by the time we look at the, uh, the eight choices to go, this model is useless at predicting what subjects will do in the first um, choice. Okay, so we need to have to say what, uh, what else is going on to in order to make this uh, work. So the first thing you might think, well, it's just unreasonable to think that our, our subjects who are, after all, only UCL students would be capable of building a tree that big. We should have Sheffield students that would go further. Um, so one way of capturing that is to say that maybe there's just a termination process in this tree. So at some point when they start to build a tree, every time they build another layer, we have some probability gamma of that they, that they, they, they just don't build a tree beyond that, below that level. Um, so that already does an awful lot better. But there's another factor too, which is we expect this, um, this Pavlovian mechanism, which says that th there's a particular time when subjects will like to prune their trees. And that's when they have this large negative punishment. And that's what we expect to be associated with serotonin. So the way we capture that is by having uh, um, pruning, which not only generic pruning, just says every time you build a tree, but each time you go um, one stage further, um, but if you go through the large negative punishment, that minus 140 or minus 100 or minus 70, then you have an additional propensity to prune. So we separate out a pruning parameter to a, gener a general state, general pruning, and a specific pruning, and that's only attached to this large negative punishment. And then we're going to fit behavior, and we can ask ourselves, for instance, the question, is this parameter bigger than this parameter, which means they're more likely to prune in cases where there's the large uh, negative reinforcement. Um, so that turns out that that, becomes, that has a significant impact in predicting behavior. And then there's one more effect too, which is the chicken effect. So um, what we look at is a state from which there's a, um, a s uh, from which um, uh, we can ask what happens when there are either two or more choices to go or just one choice to go. And it's a state from which they can take a small punishment, but then in order to get a large reward, two, two, two choices down. So it's like a minus 20 in order to get the plus 140, for instance. So what you see is, if they have two or more choices to go, then all groups have a high probability of taking that transition that can allow them to get this big reward uh, too quick uh, uh, in, the, in the second step. But if you look at the case where they have one choice to go, there's no point in taking that choice because you're not going to get the big reward that happens uh, after the second step. You're not going to get that second step. 
But nevertheless, our subjects in all these three groups are perfectly are quite willing, much, much more willing than the previous model with, with, with the bits I've talked about is to do that action because essentially they, they, they say, well, and, and our interpretation of that is that they have this automatic, me another automatic mechanism, just like the chicken, to approach that state, even though the state actually isn't worth approaching in this particular case because they're not going to be able to take the advantage of getting there. So when we put that, so we put a factor that parameterizes that too, and when we do that, you can see the blue bars at the top show how well we're able to predict the behavior of the subjects. And I think you can see that we do a, a really a excellent job in you know, pretty much almost 90% for all these different sequences, even in the case we ask subjects to do eight choices. And here, remember, we're predicting the very first choice that they make. Okay, so I think we have a good handle on behavior. We've used um, various sorts of model comparison methods to show that each of these components is an important component in order to make predictions. Um, uh, and um, what we can then do is look at the parameters and say, you know, do we have a handle on what's really going on? So the key thing for us is to understand this specific pruning. Right? That's this mechanism which we said that if you, make a if you go through this large negative reinforcement, that never does you, you prune. So what we expect to s the signature of that to be is that gamma s, this specific pruning parameter, will be bigger than gamma g, which is the general pruning parameter. And what you see is that's true in all three groups. And in fact, there's no significant difference between the propensity to prune in each of, the, each of the three groups, despite the fact that in group 140, it's actually um, benign to prune. It doesn't matter whether you prune or not. In group 70, they're losing a huge amount of income here because of their, the, because of their, their, their willingness to do this specific pruning. And so, so, that, so nevertheless, it's just a heuristic which is applied. And we think, as I say, that it may be related to this, Pavlovian, uh, this underlying Pavlovian mechanism. So to test that, we took um, uh, uh, what's called a Beck de um, depression inventory on our subjects. So, we just, so these are perfectly normal subjects, and so they have very narrow range of, um, of you know, they're not, not depressed subjects at all. Um, but nevertheless, there's still a range of, of um, a s a mild a range in the, in the non-depressed category of their BDI scores. And we look to see if there's a, any correlation between the BDI score that they have and their, their, um, uh, their propensity to prune, or indeed other aspects of, of what's going on. And what you see is that there's a, there was a, um, a significant correlation between the, the, specific, the amount of specific pruning and this BDI score. And what we are interpreting this as is that they're essentially subjects who are more reliant on pruning. They have this automatic mechanism, a crutch for their decision making. Um, they're the ones who are going to be have problems if anything goes wrong with that specific mechanism. So if something goes wrong with serotonin processing for, for whatever reason, then if you've been relying on that, you haven't got the, 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 the um, predictive resources, if you like, in order to actually um, uh, to, to, uh, work out for yourself what the best course of action is, or you have less uh, ability to do that. And therefore, you're going to therefore you may be in more trouble uh, uh, down the line. Okay, just to sum up on, on serotonin in, in inhibition. So it's a Pavlovian effect, right? It's not... You know, it's not optimal by any means. You can see there's, there's our poor subjects are losing um, you know, hundreds of points by making, by making these choices. But it's a heuristic which maybe makes sense. You just don't, you know, given this uh, complexity, it's just not worth trying to build the tree. A good way to prune this tree is when you get this one, this large negative thing, which just, it just goes away. Um, it had a, um, a sort of technical reason to be interesting for us, which I haven't really got time to go into. So maybe normally, like all other Pavlovian things, it's normally a good idea to have it. But when it breaks down, you know, a catastrophe happens. So what happens is one of the strange phenomena in, in depression is this notion of depressive realism, which is that um, depressed subjects are both more realistic and uh, about the how nasty the world is and how little control they have over it, whereas normal people are over-optimistic that they think they have lots of control and their life, the world is really nice. Um, so, uh, um, so an interesting question is why would you see this sort of depressive realism? Why would, people, why would depressed subjects be more realistic? Um, and um, one possibility is that they have a, that normal people have this automatic pruning mechanism which prunes away the thoughts of nasty things that could really happen and so if you lack that pruning mechanism then you're going to find out the world and to its true to its true horror um, okay uh, so now that's one aspect of interacting in this case between Pavlovian and model based now let me tell you um, about another couple which have an interaction between model based and model free so we saw one of them, well, what sort of things might we expect? We saw one of them already, habitization. So control seemed to go from uh, a willingness to press the lever, an unwillingness to press the lever when the cheese had been punished, to a willingness to press the lever even though you wouldn't eat the cheese. So we talked about that in terms of building a habit, behavioral habit, just like those Caltech students. Uh, what else could there be? Well, one important one could be model-based training of the model-free system. So for instance, an old idea in RL, in reinforcement learning certainly, 
um, but also we now we see perhaps that in motions in, uh, in, in, the, in rats, in the rapid hippocampus, that you could have essentially fictitious experience get expressed by the model-based system that could be used to train the model-free system. So basically you could just imagine paths through the world and it could then learn to teach the model-free system to uh, minimize the inconsistency, not on real paths in the world, but paths on its own model. And indeed, in the hippocampus, you see notions of pre-play and replay. So little sequences of behavior seem to get replayed during sleep and during quiet wakefulness after an animal has had experience in the world. And maybe one of the ideas about that is that that actually is, is essentially raising differences between uh, making the, the model-based system training the model-free system. Another possibility is that maybe the model-based system could teach the model-free system directly. It could give it prediction errors the model-free system could use. We see some ex an example of that. Um, there could be other sorts of interaction in choice. Maybe the model-free um, system, for instance, has to provide information to the model-based system to do choice, like in the case of chess, where you know, the idea in chess is you build deep blue builds a tree as deep as it can go, but then at some point it can't build the tree any further, and it just uses these model-free values in order to decide what to do. So there's a little bit of evidence about that too. Um, okay, so what we need in order to understand the relationship, th what I'm going to show you hopefully if I have time is these, these interactions here, but um, uh, the, what we need in order to make progress is to have a behavioral signature, we need a sort of canary for whether model-based or model-free control is in charge. So here's the canary which Nathaniel Dorr invented. So what you have is a it's very simple choice task, it's, only very si it's an even simpler tree where there are just two levels. So level, uh, 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 the first level where they make a choice between these are little Tibetan symbols, we call them A and B, C and D and so forth. There's, there's some green ones. And then there's, there's two other states, a pink state and a blue state. And the idea is somebody's going to choose, let's say A, they go to one, either the pink one or the blue state. They're going to choose one of the, the symbols here, let's say go to the blue state. They choose another symbol here, C, and they might get a reward or not at the end. Okay, so the way this system works, the way we program the probabilities, is that if you press A, you're 70% likely to get to the pink one and 30% to the blue one. If you choose B, you're 70% likely to get to the blue one and 30% likely to get to the pink one. So what we, I invite you to consider is what would happen if you pressed A, you got to the unlikely outcome, which is the blue guy, you pressed C, and then you got a big reward, much bigger than you had before. If I now put you back in the green box, what will you do? I think there are two credible possibilities. One of them, so that's this discussion. So A goes to C, C goes to megabucks, so do you do more of A or B at the top? So one idea is the model, um, uh, um, uh, the, 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 uh, so the two ideas, there's a model-based idea and a model-free idea. So the model-free idea says, well, you pressed A, you got a big reward for doing it, so next time I get the chance, I'm going to press A again. Seems pretty reasonable, right? But there's another idea, too, a bit more sophisticated, which says, well, I pressed A, but the way I got that reward was from C, was, not, was from the blue box, not from the pink box. If I wanted to get to the blue box next time, I'm more likely to get there by pressing B than I am by pressing A. So even though I got this megabucks by pressing A, next time I should be more likely to press B instead of A. So the model-based system chooses B, the model-free system chooses A, where actually technically it might actually have no effect on the next trial. You might have to wait one more trial to get it. So that's just a technicality. Okay, so here's our canary. We put subjects, give subjects a task like this, that we'll show a slightly different version in the next uh, slide, and ask, do they press B or do they press A? Seems uh, fairly reasonable. So let me show you exactly that. Uh, why don't I show you exactly that first? I was going to give you a different one first. Let me. Okay, let me show you how we uh, uh, did that. Yes. Yeah, so the here, what we expect is that the um, subjects will uh, have the. Tr we've trained them. We can train them uh, uh, extensively before we start. For instance, what the probabilities are, so they know about these probability structures, and then we can ask them. So I'll show you a latent learning task in a minute. But first of all, let me show you this other one, which uses exactly this this uh, task, because they're going to learn. We make the. Uh, what we do in this case is to make the, um, the probabilities exactly the same, but we change, in w when we did this, we change the outcome probabilities at the bottom, so the pink and blue ones. They were changing all over time, all the whole time. But the, but the uh, transition probabilities were always fixed, always 70 and 30, which means that, so we changed the bottom level probability such that they would um, continue to explore. They had a reason to continue to explore and still engage with the task. We kept the top level probabilities the same so we could actually detect whether they were using this, this model-based or model-free reasoning. Um, okay, so here's another way of putting that, which is uh, in this uh, uh, same case here, uh, what we're looking at is, I'm just de describing this, this, this piece of reasoning this, uh, in a different way. We look here at a one-step change in probability, so state probability as a function of whether you were rewarded or not, 
and whether or not, so that in this case in a binary case, whether you've got a reward, so rather than making, uh, changing the amount of reward, and whether or not the first transition was common or rare. So um, in all these cases, if you did the get the common one, that means you go from green to, p you know, you press A, you get to the pink one, you get a big reward, then of course your state probability is going to be fairly high. Um, what's interesting is the difference between model free and model based is what happens in the, in the rare cases. So the model free system says doesn't care about whether it's rare or common. It says I did this A, I got a big reward, I'm going to do A more. So I'll do A just as much the next time. Whereas the model based system says I did A, I got a big reward, but I got a big reward from the, from the blue state. So I'm going to do whatever it takes me to get to blue next time more. So you see the difference here is between this guy and this guy, and then similarly between the rare transitions and the unrewarded ones. So when we did exactly this task, what we saw in behavior, so this is you know, pretty much after they've obviously learned the probability, we saw really a mixture of model free, this is across all our subjects, we saw a mixture of model free and model based behavior. So you can see that this data is nicely interpolates between the two um, uh, model free and model based. And, we, and indeed our subjects are different, and so we might expect to get different characteristics in, in individual subjects. Okay, so what we did is um, we uh, fit a model of these Q values. So these Q values are propensity, you know, how, how, much, how well worthwhile is it to do an action as a state? So we have something which uh, came from this model free system, and we said we have a beta parameter for how much then the value might come from the model based system. And so we could ask on a subject by subject basis, we could try and infer the value of beta that they themselves use. And maybe you assume that it's going to be stationary for individual subjects. There are some very model free subjects, some very model based subjects. And we could then see what else could we understand about them by looking at the processing in the, in the brain. So you said beta will vary by subject. So we did this in the scanner, and what we could do is look at regions that are involved in pr processing reward prediction errors and ask what do they show in these, um, in these cases. So when we do, this is a, a, a fMRI result. So what you're doing is you're measuring bowel signal, which is a blood flow signal. In, in this case, um, you know, we look at the whole brain, but the areas we expect to find it are areas which are the target projections of the dopamine system. So we don't know the coupling between blood flow and neural processing in, in, in really anywhere, and we certainly don't know what it looks like in the striatum. But in many, many studies over the last 10 years or so, it's been found that prediction errors, like the one I showed you with the, um, the dopamine cells, are found to correlate with bold signals in areas like the ventral striatum, which is a si part of the system involved in, in, in uh, emotional evaluation, if you like, and also control. And so it's an area that you know, we, there's, you know, there's a lot to say about it. We haven't really got time. But certainly, it tells us something about prediction errors that we see. So what we did is we looked at the prediction error, which is actually the model-free prediction error in A. We also looked for the model-based prediction error in um, B. And what we really did was to say, how much in the, uh, would the brain signal, this neural signal that we see in this area of the, this region of the brain, how well fit is it to increasing amounts of model-based prediction error sort of dragging you away from the model-free prediction error. So we can fit essentially a number which says how, how much model-based prediction error there is in this region. And what we found is that um, the same region that has this model-free prediction error also has a model-based prediction error. And furthermore, the more on an individual subject basis that your behavior was controlled by the model-based system, the more this neural signature actually showed a um, dependence on the model-based uh, prediction error too. So that was an interesting result, but it's made more interesting by the following fact, which is that the model-based system doesn't use this sort of prediction error for learning model-based reasoning. It does model-based reasoning in a different way, like it does this tree-based thing. It doesn't work out consistency on feature parts. And instead, the only reason for the model-based system to, to compute this, well, one sensible reason, at least, would be to train the model-free system. So our interpretation of this result is it's creating this model-based prediction error, and it's using it to train the model-free system. So we have to do another round of experiments, essentially, to test that, because we, you know, we didn't expect this result, and so this is a, you know, we, the, 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 the task wasn't beautifully designed to, to examine this. But our one conclusion that comes out of this is that really that's what's uh, essentially going on in this structure, is the model-based system is training the model-free system using this, um, uh, um, and because we see the signal in exactly the same region, so the signal the model-based system itself has no reason, it really has no reason to have. Okay, let me just tell you about one more study uh, before I stop. So um, the first study we tried with this, a task like this is actually a latent learning study. So this is one of the earliest ideas that we saw actually in the, data in the work of um, Tolman, who's very interested in, in latent learning. So we did a version of this um, two-step task where what we did was to um, train subjects on the transition structure of the maze without telling them about what the, what the outcomes were. We then told them what the outcomes were and asked what they, uh, what they did. So here we gave them extensive experience, like 80 trials or something, where 
they learned, so here they saw, instead of seeing two patterns, they saw one pattern at the top, they could press left or right, then they got 70 to the pink one, 30 to the red one, 70 to, if they went left, if they went right, there was 70 to the gold one, 30 to the, uh, to the other fancy patterns. And then they do another choice and they get these things at the bottom. So it's this really same structure, there's two levels of, of choice. And they, but in the first stage, all they saw was state exposure. There was no rewards at all. So the model three system has nothing to work with. There's no rewards. It doesn't know how, what to do. Then we instructed subjects by model, yeah, we just told them that these outcome states had a certain value in terms of, uh, this was done in America, so they went in with a certain number of cents for each of them. So they said, if you go to the blue guy, you'll get 25 cents. If you go to the green guy, you get 10 cents. The, the, this one, you get zero cents. So, they so then we asked them to, um, to make a choice. Right. Now, the very first trial, after they've seen the transition structure and the values of what they can get, um, the only way they could do control that way is by the model-based system. The model free system has never seen a reward or a punishment in its life. Right? And so we could therefore test for that very first trial what happened. If they could choose the correct action here, which is to go, I can't remember, left or right, one of the others, um, then that would be uh, evidence that the that subjects were capable of doing model-based reasoning in this task. And indeed, what we saw is that 13 out of 18, su uh, 18 subjects chose the right action, the correct action, um, uh, this model uh, uh, based on this. But then we just carried on doing learning, just like we did for the, for the, for the previous task I showed you, except that this time we're not, um, we're not uh, um, uh, changing the, the values at the bottom. We just leave these values to be fixed. We just see what happens over, over time. So the model-based system always has the right information throughout. Then so and what we did is to say, well, maybe... We could see the process. What we expected to see is the process of habitization, right? The process of slowly changing from it being things being controlled by the model based system to being controlled by the model free system, because that's what we expected. So we offered it an architecture in which you had a model free route and a model based route. And we said, okay, let's just try and look at the structure by which their behavior is being driven in a model free way, because we could see evidence of that using our canary that I talked about before. And um, here was where our surprise was. So when you fit this model, what, what this, the, 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 this is the key plot, which says, as a function of trials, after we tell them about the reward contingency, this says, how big is the model-based inference? So it starts off, the model-based inference is you know, bigger than a half. So that makes sense. That's how they came to choose pretty, pretty well in the first trial when, the, when, the, when we switch on um, the reward contingency. But if you notice, we get essentially an exponential decay. Oh, this is a fitted exponential, but it actually fitted the data pretty well, with a time constant of roughly you know, 10 trials or so. So habitization is phenomenally quick ridiculously quick in this case. So subjects, even though the model-based system is always right, it never is wrong. It has the right information to start with. That information is confirmed by every single transition and every single outcome. Nevertheless, the model-based system loses control after only 10 trials in a, s in a task which only has really two levels. So it um, shows you something of the power of model-free reasoning. It's really uh, uh, keen to, um, to, uh, to, get to take over. Okay, so let me um, just sum up. Um, so what I tried to tell you is that, that we have different sorts of reasoning. So model I talked about, model-based, model-free, and Pavlovian reasoning. And there's a reason to have those, because there's a good way, they're, they're, they represent good way, appropriate ways of doing control. They are different sweet spots in, in, the, in uncertainty, in different sorts of uncertainty. So it's a good idea to have them, and then you have to then think about how they arbitrate. So we know that there are separate neural mechanisms, partly separate neural mechanisms, because of lovely work from Belaine, um, Dickinson, um, Simon Kilcross, many other uh, investigators um, about where, they, where these different uh, signals live. And now in human experiments, we've been able to use that, those expectations to drive experiments that have told us something about where they are in the, in the human brain too. So we know air regions of striatum, regions of, of the PFC, we know something about the, the neuromodulatory structures too. There's some interesting puzzles left for this for us, which is things like, so, so um, uh, those of you who are familiar with the, uh, the famous book by O'Keefe and Nadal, which is the hippocampus as a cognitive map. The idea of the cognitive map, in their minds, is very closely associated with the hippocampus instead of with the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex or the, or the, um, or the dorsal medial striatum. So there certainly is some evidence the hippocampus might be involved in some sorts of planning, but maybe not all. And so we're very interested in understanding what the hippocampus might be doing in these things. We've talked about various interactions. So habitization, it's in this one. Model-based prediction errors could train the model-free system. We saw that in the, in the task that I showed you. There could be model-based replay. I didn't show you that, but there's evidence in, in data from Jade Reddish and other investigators too that that may be happening. And it may, we don't know really about its causal impact yet in terms of learning. Um, we're expecting model-free values to ground model-based reasoning. We have a little bit of evidence of that in a task I didn't have time to tell you about. 
But in a sense, that's one of the, the next major goals is to really nail what that really looks like. That's just like in chess, where you want to use your position evaluator to inform the choice of actions you do uh, higher up. And then, um, uh, um, and then we, uh, then there are other sorts of, uh, uh, of issues too that we haven't yet completely investigated. So one of them, for instance, is if you have one system is in control early on, like the model basis controller, it gets to influence the experience that the model three controller builds its model three values based on. So if something goes wrong with model based control, maybe the prior about the world that he has are incorrect. We've done some work on a, a paradigm called learned hopelessness, which is a model of depression and anxiety based on that. It can prevent the model three system from getting the experience that it needs to get the correct values. And so we can expect some interesting interactions that way too. Um, in the longer term, there's an interesting battle in the literature between whether the ultimate controller is really model three or model based. So we might like to think that you know, our conscious selves are in control the whole time, which is um, that they maybe take advantage of model three reasons. We tend to think that probably it's actually maybe the other way around, that it's the model three system is in control. And occasionally you get a little bit of a conscious process in, um, in s sneaking under the, under the radar. And what I did tell you about, and what actually is a, a, a large amount of my own research time at the moment, is these overriding Pavlovian inferences, which I think are really important for just general behavior and also really important in psychiatry too, which is one of the areas we're working on. Okay, thank you very much. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so pruning. So at the moment we're really okay. So there's a very extensive set of Pavlovian controls, but it's very, um, you know, it's one of these things which is really a little bit hard to investigate because they're species specific. So for instance, this is best understood in defensive maneuvers where even like rat defensive um, things are different from mouse ones, for instance. There's some lovely work from Bollis in the last, you know, like in the 1980s where they were looking at these things. So there'll be lots of very specific things that the Pavlovian mechanism will do. So we've been more interested in these sort of ge more generic things like approach behavior and withdrawal behavior, which we think are more going to be fairly generic overviews. But you're absolutely right that if you refuse, you know, if you're forced always to approach something, then you're never gonna, you can't learn the benefit of not approaching it. And indeed, we've done explicit tasks where we've um, r where we uh, ask subjects to learn um, cases where, like, uh, no go to win. That means you're going to win just like the chicken. You're going to sort of win food if you don't make an action in a particular case. And you know, a third of our subjects, for instance, couldn't learn in those those sorts of tasks because they you know they they're just natural incentives to go with the with that, and so they don't go to the store uh, in general. But you know, the flip side of that is you can say, well, these are really unfair cases, right? You know, we, you know, this is you know, the world doesn't come, you know, isn't, you know, nature is not malicious, to use uh, you know, uh, the phrase. It's only it's only random rather than actually malicious, and that may be true. Um, but uh, certainly, I think that uh, um, when we start to think about uh, risk sensitivity, about framing a whole bunch of different sort of behavioral economic anomalies, we can see. I think that man many of these uh, the sort of these Pavlovian sort of systems are are very important. Now there are ways that the model-based system can try and get around that. So, for instance, I like the, to take the example of uh, sort of impulsivity in something like dieting, for instance. So, you um, uh, uh, so uh, you're, let's say you're on a diet, then you know that if you go too close to the Pavlo to the bakery, you know the bakery with this you know sort of beautiful cream bun smell wafting out of the door, then you'll be you'll have this Pavlovian mechanism that will take you inside to buy your cream bun even if you don't want to. So your model-based system can take advantage of that and say, well, I'm going to plan a long route, you know, the long route around to my office so that I don't get tempted by the horrible baker. So there are ways that you can try and control that, but they're quite difficult, and that's why you know, we see these sort of uh, 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 inferences which are, are, are inferences which are important. So we normally just counterbalance those. So we just say, we just want to have a set of identifiable stimuli, which maybe we may not want them to be necessarily nameable, right? So that's what also we use the Tibetan characters have the same thing. You know, you can, you, you, we don't want them to, we don't want people to necessarily to try and sort of verbalize all these relationships. We just like them to learn them in a, in a, in a, in a, um, uh, in, in a sort of less nameable way. And so it's not, we, it, you know, obviously if we presented stimuli which were really similar to each other, so we could be then studying, you know, the, the discrimination learning, or we could have done things that the 
psychologist are interested in, where we could have the stimuli could vary on a couple of different characteristics, let's say, and one of those characteristics would be um, correlated with their rewarding characteristic, with their, whether they would reward or not, and another characteristic wouldn't. Then we could look at things like generalization and say that if they'd figured out that all red things were more valuable than all green things, for instance, then you know, across this whole collection of patterns, they could already make a prediction about what the value of a new stimulus would be, for instance. So that would be really interesting. You know, that's obviously there's a lot of work in those, that sort of area about generalization. And certainly we could have sort of Bayesian theories of generalization, that sort of thing, which is a, a fairly popular at the moment. But as far as these experiments are concerned, we didn't want to have generalization. We want to have nice, punctate, separate states so that we know that subjects aren't confused about that, so that we can see our canaries for which way they're, which way, which, which way they're going. And also, in the case of things like the tree-based task, like the, you know, like the, the pruning task, for instance, there, you know, you know, if they had confusing stimuli as well as having to make eight choices, I think our subjects would rebel in mass or panic. So we didn't want that. Showing the latent learning or what? what okay, uh, so I actually went out of order in when I did those. So just for latent learning, I talked about this uh, study. This, uh, the, the, yep. Yes. What I was, tr what we're trying to do here, what we expected. Well, what we did was to look at uh, trying to make a relationship between two um, numbers which come out of two completely different analyses of the same behavior. So one number, which is the number shown on this axis, says when we look at the subject's behavior, essentially how model-based or how model-free are they? Formally, that means if we build these Q values, which is the, the worth of doing an action as a state, if we try to fit the best model of those values with respect to the behavior that we see in, the, in our subject, we ask for the individual subject how much they're using the model-based mechanism themselves. So there's a beta parameter, which I showed on the previous slide, where we say that's, and so, that, so for each of our subjects here, we have a number, which is how, which is the value on this axis, which is how model-based is their behavior. One dot is one subject, in fact. It's the scatter plot of subjects. Very standard fMRI study, exactly. But this is a, you know, the standard, this is the real standard sort of numbers for a method. Um, because it's just a regression line, right? So the, the question for us is, is there a correlation between this number and this number is a very noisy number. So let me tell you what this number is, and you can see whether it makes sense. This number you may think may not may not sense at all. So here, what this says is we we're looking at an area of the of the brain that we know to be involved in making prediction in reporting prediction errors. And it may not be making prediction errors, and this is a bold sort of blood flow signal anyway. And we say um, uh, we ask uh, uh, how much the acti the bold signal in this area wants to be pulled away from the model free prediction error towards the model based prediction error. So again, that's a single number for each subject, you know, based on you know, based on this model based reason, and so that's what we're trying to correlate. So the the straight line is neither you know so the actual straight line is neither here nor there. We're just asking: is there a significant correlation, I you know statistically significant correlation between these two numbers? Now, of course, that relationship could be a much more complicated relationship than is shown by a straight line, and indeed, this number is an incredibly noisy number because neural signals, fMRI signals, are very is very small. No, no, that's not true. So it's a statistically significant. Uh, it's statistically significant. Now you can argue about the notion of statistical significance, but uh, but it's not. It, you know, we're testing exactly against the random fluctuation. So it is statistically significant relative to random fluctuation. And so that's. Uh, so I'm not worried that this is a. That this is not statistically significant. I'm much more worried about what the about the, for instance, the coordinate system for this number versus the coordinate system for that number. That'd be a very legitimate question to, to ask. And so you could ask for other sorts of non other sorts of monotonic relationships. Um, between these two, so you know, therefore, uh, I'm certainly not going to tell you that, th that I'm expecting this this particular straight line to be the straight line which ju which justifies uh, everything. But the important thing is, you're asking a question about the relationship between the behaviour of the subject, which is in one coordinate system, and the neural signals associated with that in another coordinate system. And so that so the statistics of that, I think, are, are perfectly sound. It's just the question is whether or not the um, what the, the exact relationship. And it'd be nice to have a lot more subjects to collect more money to do some more more uh, experiments.